Welcome to the GovComs podcast, bringing you the latest insights and innovations from experts and thought leaders around the globe in government communication. Now, here is your host, David Pembroke. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to GovComs, the podcast that examines the practice of content communication in government and the public sector. My name's David Pembroke, and thank you very much for coming back once again. And if it's your first time, thank you for joining us on this podcast. And indeed, just a bit of a plug early. If you do like listening to this podcast, please share it around. Let people know. It helps the uh, podcast to be discovered. And if you're a long-time listener and you do enjoy it, please, if you could just do that, leave some comments on our website, that would be great. All helps to get the message known. Today, we have a very interesting conversation in Promise because what we're looking to do is to discuss generational change, but not only generational change, but a focus on the younger generations and how we speak and understand younger generations and their motivations, impacts on technology, all sorts of things like that, because are people different? Have they changed? Someone who's got the answers is Claire Madden, who is a social researcher, keynote speaker, media commentator, and she does understand social trends in this area and the implications of generational change. She's written a book, Hello Gen Z, Engaging the Generation of Post-Millennials, which looks at the importance of connecting with future generations and the benefits of doing so. And she has featured on all sorts of media here in Australia in particular, on the Sunrise program, The Drum, on the ABC, The Project, which is on Channel 10, The Today Show, The Daily Edition, The Morning Show and Sky News Business. And she joins me now. Claire, thank you very much for joining me on GovComs. Great to be with you. It's a it's a big question, isn't it? This whole sense of are people different and how are they different and do we have to communicate? But are people any different, the younger generations, or are people just people living in a different age? It's a great question. And when we're talking about generations, uh, we've they are really big stereotypes Mm. where we're trying to say what were the formative influences that shaped the way that a group of people who grew up at about the same time see the world. But, of course, as humans, as people, there's a lot that that carries across every generation. But I guess the point of of looking at it is is realising there are some things that uh, change as a result of particularly the technologies and the social and world events that happen in our formative years and and shape our perspective. So where at this stage do you see those big changes as a result of technology? Because as you say, it's a completely different world in terms of the way communication works. That's right. And the speed of change with technology over the last decade or so has been really quite remarkable and has impacted our our day-to-day interactions, our socialising, our learning, our work in extraordinary ways. And when I was researching Gen Zs for the book I wrote, a lot of them, I asked them about what's defined your generation and a response I heard repeatedly was, well, technology and social media. And it's the ubiquitous nature of this technology, it's Um, from their waking moments, often for our Gen Zs, the first thing they do when they wake up is reach over, turn off their smartphone alarm and then manage their streaks on Snapchat and other social media um, things. And so it's it's just infused into pretty much every waking moment for many of our young people. And But how has that had that material impact or what material impact has this change in technology had on the way that, you know, Gen Z behaves? And how is it that that's different to, say, someone like me who's uh, Generation X? Yeah. And all the all the generations are using these digital technologies. But what really stood out when I was uh, conducting these interviews was the extent of integration of these technologies and how, for our Gen Zs, they've got an online world, which to them feels just about as real as their physical offline world. There's this, um, like we might go to a shopping centre to go be around people and sort of feel like we're in a community. They 
have that same sort of experience that when they open their their phones and, and go into any of their social media sites, it becomes a place where they they exist. Um, and so it it's um, changed the way, for example, they learn. Uh, one of the young girls, Jasmine, born in 1999, she said to me, Claire, we don't understand the point of memorising anything. Like, why would we memorise it when we can just look it up? And I thought, yeah, so that's a shift from even your Gen Ys or your Millennials through to our Gen Zs because through as long as they can remember, they've had devices within arm's length reach that they can access pretty much any information on the planet. And so that they don't understand why they would memorise things. Um, they're very used to things being instant. It's changed their a, approach to, say, um, contribution when it comes to, you know, them at work. They expect to be able to collaborate and be part of finding solutions and having a voice from day one in the office. Very different to, you say, your Gen Xs or your baby boomers who expected to, you know, not really have an opinion heard for, for, for you know. Yeah, pay respect to your elders, yes, all of that. Yeah, yeah because, I mean, that, and that's the thing. It's it's how this technology has impacted those sorts of things, which is interesting, um, because they've had a voice from a young age. Their idea of an encyclopedia is one they themselves change and contribute to. You know, it's not the Britannicas that were on the library shelves. It's It's the Wikipedia that they can jump on and say, yeah, I know about this, I can change that. And so... When it comes to to a workplace, for example, they bring that that perspective and approach to life in into their expectations of work. But has it changed, say, respect for people who may be more experienced? Do you think that they don't have that respect, or they're just so full of enthusiasm and knowledge and understanding? And they, as you say, they've always had a voice, so they should they feel that they can express that because that's the way it's always been. Yeah, that's right. I don't think they're intentionally saying, oh, we're going to disrespect people. I think what it more is is that you, you're right, they have an enthusiasm and they're also very empowered with the technology. They're very savvy with it. It's it, it, I call them digital linguists because they speak a language of technology as fluently as their mother tongue. And so often they're more savvy about the rules of online engagement than older generations and things. And They've got their finger on the pulse of how society is shifting and moving fast. And, and so in some ways they, they have an upper hand or they're, they're empowered, even though they're the young ones who um, don't have maybe the work experience yet. So it creates a different kind of dynamic. They are keen to contribute. They're not afraid to leave the well-worn track and, and, and forge a new path because they've seen so much disruption and so much is possible. So it brings in, uh, I guess, this this attitude of, all right, well, we want to change the world and we want to be part of it and we want to contribute. I don't want my life to be wasted here. Um, and and so it does come across um, like they they just you know want the um, the fun part of work or they they want to you know be in the heart of it straight away. And it can come across as you know not not respectful sometimes. Um, I, you know, it could be interpreted as that, I, I suppose. Mm. So just for clarity purposes, Gen Z is 18 and younger? Yeah, well, it's one of those things that, unfortunately, sociologists can't really agree on the years of generations, but uh, we really define them as, as Generation Z born 1995 to 2009. So this year they're aged 9 to 23. So they're entering our workforce at the upper end. Right. And so just going back to that point around not seeing the need to, to memorise, what impact do you think that that will have on the, on the way Gen Z works and the way Gen Z can contribute to, to a workplace? Well, they are uh, – one of the young guys, Matt, born in the year 2000, said to me, we collaborate as part of who we are. So they are – collaborators in they are used to being able to use their networks you know through social media and different ways as a way of working as a way of finding solutions as a way of um you know progressing things they think oh well i'm not good at that but i know sophie is or you know i can ask jack because he knows how to do this and and so they collaborate in finding um 
finding answers and and, and solutions. Um, they use their online tools all the time to, to find answers as well. But I have found that they are more comfortable often communicating where there's screen mediated um, communication. So often they're more comfortable behind a screen than face to face. And and some of the young people talked to me about that. They said, oh, we're losing the ability to have a conversation face to face. And I think that the the um, impact also is, you know, we might need to actually explicitly teach some of those interpersonal and face to face communication skills um, to balance out their, you know, their, their savviness behind the screen, but not necessarily, you know, without the screen. Mm. Are, are they aware of that? And do they understand that that could potentially have an impact on their effectiveness if they are unable to have a face to face conversation or unable to make a presentation? Yeah, certainly numbers of them brought it up with me. They said we're losing the ability to interact socially. So some of them definitely um, are aware. They are also brought up with me that they they have incredibly short attention spans. So they had awareness about that as well. Um, But I think uh, it's the only world they've ever known, one of being experiencing sensory overload and apps and phones and devices which are incredibly fast moving and colorful and visual and kinesthetic and auditory all at once, you know, trying to grapple for their attention. And, and so these young people are, can be aware that they don't have some of these other skills, like the ability to focus long time or um, interpersonal skills, but they don't necessarily know how to get them or have the confidence sometimes to, to, to get them. Um, but, but they, you know, having said all that, face-to-face interaction is still important to them as a generation. So in terms of numbers of Generation Z that you would look to or think as as, um, as you refer to them, digital linguists, is it 90%? Is it 100%? Is it, com- is it pervasive in terms of the way those that, that generation behaves? Yes, uh, it, it is extremely pervasive uh, I mean you've always got um, people who don't fit the the sort of generational stereotypes but um, it is the the normal way of of engagement is um, I mean uh, Australian teens are spending 2.7 hours a day on average connected to social media according to research done by the Australian Psychological Society so um, it's it's an extraordinary um, amount of time they are online and, and connected with each other, and that would be the, the mainstream um, reality. Mm. So this podcast is for government communicators, so people who work in the, gov- the communication function inside government. Mm. And interestingly, uh, at the, I was at the launch at the National Portrait Gallery here in Canberra a couple of weeks ago of Innovation Month, and Dr. Martin Parkinson, who's the head of Prime Minister and Cabinet, said something I found fascinating when he said that the future of government innovation is in the hands of the graduates and interns of today. And it's the role of the senior leadership to listen and to learn what we can from them. What is Mark and Martin Parkinson going to listen? What, when he listens, uh, what is he going to learn uh, from this generation in terms of that innovation um, Mm. around public service? I really think he has a point there because the, this, this generation are so infused and connected in with the technology that um, they know the rules of engagement. And for example, they explained to me some pretty hilarious things that I had no idea about when it comes to different rules like texting. They said, um, you cannot send a sentence. This was a, a, a girl called uh, Lauren. She said, you cannot send a sentence with a full stop at the end because you look mad um, or just K and then full stop because you look <laughs> angry, like I'm done with you. And she said, you know, it, it's, it means I don't want to reply because I dotted you. And I couldn't believe it, but numbers of kids talk to me about this, like full stops, simple punctuation is one thing to, you know, one generation, something totally different to another. And that's just one small example of how many 
unwritten rules there are around um, engagement, around where society's heading, around um, how to how to communicate effectively to customers and and. I would say get these Gen Zs on your team in communications because they, uh, along with, of course, other generations, I think we've got the strength when we've got the mix because we're trying to engage with all different generations in our society. But for even for, for myself as a Gen Y, I cannot keep up in the same way with the nuances that they know. And I think that, that the best thing is is to absolutely get them involved listen to them, test things. There's rules on, you know, we think, oh, we're pretty up to date. We've got an Instagram account. Well, that doesn't, that doesn't nail it. What it's how we use it. And it's all these subtleties and nuances. And, and the same with, you know, um, I think happens when we've been running organizations a certain way for a, a long time, these Gen Zs can look at it and think, why would you do it like that? It's so much easier and better to, to, to run to do it like this because they've they've grown up amongst this disruption. So I totally agree. They are innovative and they're entrepreneurial, and we would benefit to have them on our teams. So, what change then do you see, perhaps five years, ten years down the track, as this generation starts to uh, mature and it starts to grow in terms of its influence? How are things going to be any different to to the way they are today as a result? of the way this generation will apply itself to the way it lives its life or the, or the way that people live their lives? Well, it's a great thing to consider. And like any generation as they mature, some of these characteristics we're currently seeing are probably partly life stage dependent, um, but others will be enduring characteristics. And we are seeing the workplace that shift to more of a short-term contracts, a, a gig economy where people work on project-based work and um, things. And, and I think that we will see businesses need to be agile and adaptive and respond quickly. It's um, I think also we'll see the, the need for collaborative leadership styles, which quickly get the best out of the talent in our teams, you know, not waiting a year or two of that young person sitting around the office till, till we have them involved, but, but quickly getting out the, the um, get, getting the best out of people because things are shifting, shifting fast. So I think, uh, as we've seen over the last number of years, those often organisations where there's more traditional hierarchical, slower moving change can really be challenged in this environment where it is it is more fast moving, agile, and, and we need to be responsive. And I think our, our Gen Zs are very aware of that. They fear irrelevance, they fear being left behind, and they'll be on the front foot in, in, in creating agile organizations so in terms of of government where you know it's traditional well because of what you know the business that government's in you know it needs mm. to be considered it needs to think clearly about a number of the difficult issues that are emerging and so this sense of speed and change is perhaps more difficult so how does how does a gen z sort of fit into that environment in, in a way that they feel that they can make a contribution but done so in a positive way yeah, and it, it is difficult, more difficult in highly regulated sectors and industries and, and often government, you know, have a lot that, that they're handling and managing and, and large systems. Um, but I, I think that if we get a culture of innovation and collaboration, even in our teams and, and, and look at well, why do we have certain processes in place and are they actually serving us or are we now serving that, that system or that process? And in whatever authority of leadership we have to be able to um, ask the question, is this the best process for our future? It might have served us well in the past, but is it now the best? And and can we um, perhaps be less precious about some of that process and look at more outcomes? Um, and one of the best examples around um, online engagement I've seen from um, it. Uh, kind of area is the New South Wales Police Force have a fantastic Facebook following of over a million followers and they have uh, they they do a great job of um, communicating the important updates about 
you know, policing and, and what's happening in the community. And then they throw in these memes, which are those images that have words um, over the top of them that Gen Z, that they speak a language of memes. So anyway, they, they seem very random maybe to older generations, but it's totally hilarious and and makes a lot of sense to younger generations who spend time online. And, and I saw one of their posts had something like, um, 22,000 likes and 8,000 shares, from, which is is extraordinary. Um, and, and so what they've done really well is, is still say, hey, we can still have a personality and we can actually connect with, um, you know, th- this new cohort, even though what we're doing is, you know, is, is serious and important. And I think, you know, it, part of what government agencies, different agencies can do is look at, well, how can we actually... Um, be a bit more relevant or communicate um, with a bit of um, relevance and and life and um, fun, even though we've got an important message and job to do as well. So I see what you're saying there in terms of personality, but do we have to find a way to speak across generations or should we have always perhaps thought about having a personality and not being constrained by... Uh, what perhaps we thought of in the past was the way that we had to communicate, a correct way, a more formal way. Was Should we have always perhaps been in this place where we were showing and revealing more of ourselves as opposed to being conservative because that's what we felt was the way to be most effective and trusted and authoritative? Well, definitely with the use of all this um, social media and the constant connection of you know, texting and social media, everything has created a more casual way of communicating. Um, but there's still appropriate ways in business to communicate in different forums. So uh, I, I think that it's about um, the choosing the right kind of language for the right medium. So the way that we communicate a message on Facebook is different to how we'd send an email, for example. And and so there are still rules, um, many unwritten, but there are still rules about using the right medium in the right way. Uh, but as, as overall, um, a, a lot of communication, because of the frequency of it and um, the relatability we now have in in knowing a lot more about people and organisations having personalities more, we, we probably can um, think through that that relatability side a bit more and think how could our organisation have a bit more of a personality or be seen um, a, as approachable, not just as this distant, scary, far off, you know, necessity that that sends me scary letters now and again. Um, so I think it's definitely something we can we can think about that it's it's no longer a one size fits all though because we are reaching so many generations in our communities and those in the builders generation those in it you know in their 80s and 90s will obviously need a different form of communication than the 18 year olds so we do have to tailor a few more options i think now too yeah so you would see that really that audience focus and that understanding is you know, this notion of personalization, you know, that one size fits all just isn't going to work. And really, if you're going to be effective, particularly with Gen Z, is that you have to um, be empathetic and you have to sit in their shoes. You have to understand exactly what their lives are like if indeed you're going to uh, earn a share of their, their time and their attention. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. They can, they can read straight away if an organization is authentic, if they're actually interested in connecting with them properly um just um missing the mark and and um, yeah, <laughs> trying and too hard too many dad that's jokes it. maybe <laughs> that's it and that's why i think we need them on our teams because we we think we've we've made some cool meme and they think oh gosh no you missed it so <laughs> so we need them we need them desperately on our teams yeah, yeah. i actually love it we've, we've got quite a number of young people who work on the team here and i love the enthusiasm and the passion and the you know, and they really want to get in behind. Yeah. But I, I also do find that at the heart of it, though, they're still people. You know, they're still motivated by the things that motivated me when I was the same mm-hmm. age. You know, that notion of, of recognition, that notion of trust, that notion of responsibility, that they're still the things that are, are sitting at the core of these people. So while yeah. the tools may have changed and while the environment is massively different, 
if you do speak to them with trust and you do listen and you do recognize and you do acknowledge and you do encourage, that's when you get the best out of them. So really, they're no different to anybody else in, in that way. I agree. Trust and um, recognition and all those things that resonate with any generation and, and, and anyone in our, in our teams and our, our communities. So just a final question. Looking into the future, if that's where we've been and that's where we are today, particularly with this Gen Z, what's what's coming as voice starts to play a more active role in the way that we uh, engage with devices, both in our home, in our work, in, in our car? Um, artificial intelligence becomes more sophisticated in terms of being able to process you know, vast amounts of data that can then be used to inform communication. Where, where do you see the change coming and what do people need to be looking for in the next couple of years in terms of how they understand the best way to continue to be effective? Mm. Yes, we are seeing increased humanisation of technology. Uh, it can, being uh, interacting with us more and more like a, a person would with voice recognition and we'll probably have robots in our houses assisting with all sorts of things. In fact, some of the young Gen Zs explained to me they do their homework with Siri um, the, on the iPhone or the iPad just asking Siri the answer and they, they write it down. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, we used to ask mom and dad, they ask Siri, you know, and it's pretty incredible. So I think we'll continue to see devices um, integrated into our lives, but uh, we're also seeing um, that it's not satisfying the human needs. Um, so young people who are spending extensive amounts of time on social media experience higher levels of anxiety and FOMO, the fear of missing out. Um, and so, and there is, you know, a lot of anxiety and things and, you know, with, with um, say, uh, social media sort of promising intimacy and this sort of closeness but never really delivering it because it, it lacks the commitment side of it. So I think what we're seeing is, this, the balance of, yes, technology can serve us in ways, but it will never replace face-to-face. -face. It will never replace human relationships. Think about the human side. Technology is invasive in our worlds and, and it will be, but what is it that people really actually still need? And, and, and like you've been saying, a lot of those basic human drivers cut through all generations and um uh, and I think that, that that can often set us apart if if we remember, actually, these are people and they need, um, you know, affirmation, belonging, connection, respect, all those things that, that people need. Indeed. Well, Claire, thank you so much for giving us some of your valuable time today to, to share your insights with the audience. So I know that there's there's a lot there, you know, there's so much there and it's it's it, it's got me thinking now about just exactly how I'm going to go about, you know, perhaps understanding a little bit more. I did see, you know, dotting. That's something I haven't heard of <laughs> dotting before, but maybe I'll, I'll throw that out with some of the younger guys in the team here. Um, yeah, because that'll be quite funny. I did, that K thing, I did see that from someone the other day and I was like, what's that? I didn't understand what that was. So um, that they'll continue to teach me and to teach others. So I think the, your insight also about, and I think for government comms teams is really, you know, don't leave the young out of the conversation, you know, bring them in, you know, encourage them, get them to, to, to share their ideas and their understanding. And it's not just their insights around, you know, their own generation, but other insights that they have about where they see the world going and changing and, and looking at what Mark, Martin Parkinson is saying is, you know, engage to have those conversations to understand how indeed policy, you know, programs, services and regulations can be designed and to take advantage of, of many of the changes that are taking place, but not to forget that at the at the end of all of this is a is a person and understanding how do we make those people feel um, more enriched and more part of the community and 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 better contributors as we uh, as we move into the years ahead. So thanks a lot. Now, where can people, if indeed they want to know and understand more, where where can they go to understand a little bit more about your research and you and and, and other insights that, that may be valuable to them. Best place to go is clairemadden.com 
where you can follow my blog and also get the book Hello Gen Z and, and find out more about what we do. So just claremadden.com. Okay, fantastic. And now is that Claire, C-L-A-I-R-E or A-R-E? That's Claire with all the letters, C-L-A-I-R-E. <laughs> M-A-D-D-E-N. Okay, fantastic. Okay, Claire, thank you very much uh, for joining us. And to you, the audience, thank you for coming back once again. Great conversation. Really enjoyed that. I've got a lot to think about. I've got a lot to think about. I don't know about you, but that's a real sort of, there's so much in that for us to go away with. So thank you. And uh, I'll be back at the same time next week. But for the moment, it's bye for now. You've been listening to the GovComs podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate and subscribe to stay up to date with our latest episodes.